Welcome to lecture number three of our critical thinking unit. And we have a two for one here, two short presentations in one. The first is going to be on an introduction to what arguments are in general. And the second one will clarify the distinction between inductive and deductive reasoning. All right, take a look at these two claims. What's the difference between saying he's armed and he's dangerous and he's armed so he's dangerous? How can we distinguish these two? Well, the first one makes a claim, and or makes two claims, and it may be unrelated. We've got he's armed, we've got he's dangerous, but maybe the reason why he's dangerous is completely different than the reason why he's armed. They don't necessarily have to be logically connected. The word and does little to connect the two logically. Whereas we look over here, he's armed, so he's dangerous, we have an explanation to why he is dangerous. It's because he is armed. That's what the so is doing there. So this one makes a claim he's dangerous and gives an explanation as to why he's, he's armed. So it's an argument. And that's what an argument is. Is a claim, he's dangerous, plus reasons to believe that claim. And so when I ask you to distinguish between what makes a claim and what makes an argument, you're gonna be looking for reasons to believe that claim. Are there reasons in there? Take a look at this. You're going to want to pause it probably and think about whether or not it's an argument or just a claim or something else. Some people are allergic to cats because cat saliva contains a protein that is foreign to the human immune system. It therefore stimulates the human immune system, which in some people results in sneezing, runny eyes, and so on. It's an explanation. The word therefore might make you think that there's some kind of conclusion going on, which a lot of times is the case when we use the word therefore. But really, what we have is just an ex explanation of what, of a, of a process. This happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. There's not necessarily reasons to believe that this is the case. It's just an explanation of what is the case. Let's take a look at this one. Inheritance should be illegal. After all, that's why there's so much inequality. So many kids get such a head start. They have money they don't even they didn't even earn. And money makes money. It's all unfair. You should have to earn what you get, no matter who your parents are. Uh, yes, there is a claim and reasons to believe that claim. It is an argument. Inheritance should be illegal. And then we've got some re rationale behind it. So that was our explanation of what an argument is, but now we're going to talk about different kinds of arguments, inductive and deductive arguments. So deduction is the most mathematical way to argue your point. We've already talked a little bit about sort of logos in its ideal form when we are able to abstract things into sort of clean variables um, and put them, lay them all out in an almost mathematical type of way. Um, well, that only really works when we have like generalizations. For instance, like all bananas are berries or poverty is bad. And from the premises, you know, the early steps in the argument, the conclusion is unpacked. And unpacked is an intentional word that is important. Um, because inside the claim, all bananas are berries, are lots of other little truths. Um, such as, uh, if I have a, you know, if I have a, one banana, uh, or two bananas, or ten bananas, because of that word all, then I have a berry. Um, and so if the logic works and the premises are true, that's an important caveat, the premises must be true, then the conclusion has to be true. And this makes deduction the most ironclad, strongest way to argue things. Um, so you need oftentimes these generalizations um, to make it so. And a lot of times these generalizations are hard to come by, which we'll talk about at the end. So deductive arguments are usually put in a syllogism. Um, a syllogism is a deductive argument with two premises. This is a key term that you're going to want to know. Uh, a syllogism is a premise here, a premise there, and then some kind of conclusion. However, it doesn't need to be spelled out in this format. A lot of times a syllogism will be presented in an essay where we have two facts and from those two facts we draw a conclusion. Uh, and that's totally normal. Um, we also sometimes call this syllogistic thinking. Let's take a look at this syllogism. Premise one, AP classes can give you college credit. Premise two, AP Lit is an AP course. Uh, conclusion, AP Lit gives you college credit. Is this true? 
What's wrong with this? Well, it's not true um, because it's a, uh, it said AP classes can give you college credit. Let's go back to that. AP classes can give you college credit, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all college uh, AP classes give you college credit. Um, so if you go, this is how we would need to fix it to make the syllogism work. All AP classes give you college credit. Uh, AP Lit is an AP course, therefore AP Lit gives you college credit. Um, so you may think that this is really nitpicky and very semantical. Um, you know, I'm just, when I say semantical, I mean just sort of focusing too much on the, you know, the, the words themselves and just honing in too much on the exact wording. However, this exact wording is important. And as you get higher and higher, uh, up in your academic career, um, you're going to be scrutinized and criticized for specific word choices like this. There's a big difference between between saying some and all. Um, and there's also you know, incredible logical consequences for that as well. Particularly those of you that are thinking about one day becoming a, you know, a lawyer or someone that deals with contract law or anything like that. Um, words like all and can can win the case for you. Um, so being very clear on exactly what a claim means um, is gonna be really important, particularly for deductive reasoning. Induction is how we usually come up with beliefs. This is important. We see enough reasons to think that a conclusion is probable while accepting that there's a chance it could be otherwise. Uh, the way to improve the strength of the claim is by increasing the sample size, the pool of evidence. So this is really important. Um, this will definitely be on a test forthcoming. Um, so essentially the way that induction works is I take a sample of evidence, you know, a, a number of experiences, and from that bunch of evidence, I come up with a conclusion. Let's take a look at an example. Premise one. Uh, every time I see a red sky at sea, it has been followed by a storm. So this is making a claim about, you know, red skies in general. It's not saying that every red sky will necessarily lead to a storm, but it's just saying, hey, um, Every time I see a red sky, it is followed by a storm. And like I said in the last slide, if this sample size, if my evidence, if the amount of evidence that I have is really large, if I've seen thousands and thousands of red skies all followed by storms, well, then I've got a really strong uh, premise right there. I've only seen one or two red skies and they've been followed by storms. Who knows? That doesn't seem like a, a whole bunch of evidence to support my claim. So I've got this premise here, and then my premise two, there's a red sky at sea. Therefore, there's probably a storm coming. And notice how I have to use the word probably. Um, in deduction, deductive arguments, the conclusion is ironclad. However, in inductive arguments, I'm living in a world of probabilities. So proving deduction versus proving induction. So in, de in deduction, the premises must be true. Uh, the conclusion must actually follow from them in a syllogism. That's referring back to the all versus can aspect of the logic that we were unpacking earlier. And uh, so if those aspects are there, then the conclusion necessarily must be true. Premises are true. The logic is good. Conclusion uh, necessarily will be true. Induction, however, the premises strength is reliant on the sample size. How many red skies have I seen? And even at best, after all that, the conclusion is really is just merely likely. Um, every once in a while, there'll be a random reason for a red sky, or maybe it was almost going to rain, and so there was a red sky, but it didn't quite. So is most of our knowledge based on induction or deduction? So I think I already told you this, but take a look at the following things that you think you may know. Your English teacher is a spaz. Salt makes soil difficult for growing. Like if you put salt in you know, your garden, it probably won't grow many roses. Hard work and a good mindset are rewarded with success. We must all die. So these are all inductive. The reason why the, the, uh, your, your opinion uh, about whether or not your teacher has sort of a lot, very little control over his motor function, whether or not he sort of flails his arms while he's speaking, I'm actually flailing my arms right now, um, is based off of a set number of experiences that you have. You've, you know, you've seen him lecture and walk around the room for 30 or 40 per class periods, and based off of those class periods, 
you've come up with your opinion. Um, salt makes the soil difficult for growing. The only way we know that is by after a certain number of times of people idiotically putting salt in their soil or trying to grow things in beachy sand, they're like, huh, this isn't really working. You know what? Salt must make things make soil difficult for growing. And hard work and good mindset are rewarded with success. I mean, those are things that we sort of take to get for granted as truisms. However, the only way that we know that is that we saw a lot of people working hard, they had a good mindset, and they're rewarded with success. In fact, the growth versus fixed mindset uh, lessons that you hear so often from your teachers these days um, are based off psychological studies that were proven by a Stanford professor. And th what that professor had to do is it, she had to go out, she had to measure, uh, you know, different success rates and uh, and measure different different mindsets and see if there is a connection between the two. That was something that had to be based inductively. And she was only able to publish her results after a very large sample size after using a, finding a lot of evidence. And even the fact that we all must die. We take that as a fact of life. However, uh, we only know that because everybody we've ever seen or know uh, known, uh, at least for long enough, has eventually died. Um, However, there are some scientists that say that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case and the future may be different. And so all of these things we know just because we've seen it happen enough times and from that we come up with a conclusion. Are they going to be perfect? No. I mean, actually some things can grow in salty soil. It's just harder. And if you see me on the martial art floor, I'm not very spazzy at all. I'm actually very militant and military or pardon me, military um, and very controlled. Um, and hard work and good set are rewarded with success? Well, not always. Some people are just very, very unlucky. Um, and who knows, maybe the future will change and actually not everybody has to die. Um, so inductive claims, I'd like to just repeat once more, are just probabilistic. I think that these things are all probably true in, you know, most cases. Um, and the fact that most of our knowledge is based off of induction um, tells us that we all need to be humble in general in, our, uh, in a lot of our opinions, especially the ones that we know inductively. All right, on to lecture four.